Hey, my name is Miles Cattell, and I'm going to be talking about the limbic system today. So I'm going to be discussing what the limbic system does and why it's important. And I'm also going to be talking about um, the behavior and physiology that can result from the theoretical full destruction of the limbic system via a theoretical hemorrhagic stroke that takes out the limbic system its an entirety. So next, I'm going to be discussing a case study of a man who actually experienced bilateral limbic system destruction and lived to tell the tale. I'm going to be talking about how the dysfunction in his system can theoretically explain the behavioral disruption that he experienced. Finally, I'm going to shortly mention how the limbic system can be destroyed physiologically and what happened in the case of this man. So, the concept of a single limbic system is actually a little outdated. In the past decade, literature has been generally moving away from this term and has instead um, described limbic systems for emotion and memory separately. But in this presentation, I'm going to be using the traditional terminology of limbic system to describe the structures in the brain that control uh, and modulate fear, emotions, memory, arousal, learning, and motivation. And since there is generally no consensus in the field concerning what exact structures constitute the limbic system, rather than argue, a lot of authors tend to define the limbic system as a set of highly interconnected brain regions situated within the medial portion of the brain. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. And so uh, the limbic system in the traditional sense comprises a complex set of structures that lie on both sides of the thalamus under the cerebrum, as you can see in this little picture here. Important limbic structures are composed of the thalamus, hypothalamus, hippocampus, amygdala, olfactory bulb, frontal lobe structures such as the orbital frontal cortex and basal forebrain areas, cingulate gyrus and the anterior cingulate cortex as well as the insular cortex insular cortex in order to theoretically determine what would happen in the case of complete bilateral limbic system dysfunction or destruction i'm going to look at the primary functions of these important individual limbic structures and determine what might go wrong piece by piece one structure at a time to eventually end up with a profile rather than look at the limbic system in its complete, complex entirety altogether. I think the, uh, this way will make a little bit more sense and flow a little better. So, to start, I'm going to be discussing the thalamus, the brain's relay box. So, we've discussed the thalamus a lot in previous case studies, and there's a lot that can go wrong with it. It's the brain's relay device, and it integrates sensory information with cortical information. Different specific detect um, in the thalamus can result in a wide variety of strange neurological diseases. So, for example, specific defects of the thalamus can cause specific things. So, when we discussed Huntington's, there was a theoretical disconnect in the basal ganglia uh, thalamocortical circuitry that occurred to produce the behaviors that we saw. And lesions of the thalamus can understandably result in complete sensory loss, involuntary movement or loss of movement, pain, or sensations that aren't even there. Moving on, the hypothalamus, or the homeostatic control of the body, uh, is mainly implicated in regulating hunger, thirst, response to pain, Pleasure, anger, aggressive behavior, autonomic nervous system control, like blood pressure, breathing, arousal, and more. And as we have also learned, hypothalamic dysfunction can result in some serious issues. Um, blood pressure dysregulation, hormonal imbalances, weight and appetite, satiety issues, and as well as sleep and circadian rhythm issues. In one of the case studies we talked about, the hypothalamus was implicated to not be receiving feedback. In the specific case was the prater willi syndrome. Ultimately, the hypothalamus would not receive the feedback it needed to um, from eating, 
and could never be satisfied or satiated and in turn led to unstoppable eating behavior. Next, I'm going to talk about the hippocampus. It's thought to be involved in memory consolidation, uh, especially of short-term to long-term memories. And as we know, one of the most famous cases of hippocampal damage is the bilateral lesioning study, or not study, but it's a patient who had bilateral lesions, HM, studied by Brenda Milner. Uh, basically, he had permanent enterograde amnesia and could not form new memories. Moving on, I'm going to talk about the amygdala, another portion of the limbic system. The amygdala is implicated in fear and emotion processing, and it is well known that it processes fear, but also a little bit lesser known, it processes fear learning, as shown by fear conditioning experiments like mouse shock experiments. Some research shows the amygdala also plays a role in decision making. So, um, and additionally, um, it plays a role in the startle response in fear conditioning. For example, when we discussed our jumping Frenchman study, portions of the amygdala were thought to mediate this enhanced startle response the lumberjacks were having. And like I mentioned, some research shows that the amygdala plays a role in decision making. Individuals with bilateral amygdala damage actually show decreased autonomic responses to reward and punishment illustrating that the amygdala is an important player in decision-making as well. Moving on, I'm going to talk about the olfactory bulb. It's responsible for smell uh, reception uh, because odorant receptors are found here. It's pretty straightforward. Without the receptors, we can't smell. But without it, we can affect hunger and satiety levels because it communicates to the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Moving on, we're going to talk about the frontal lobe structures, the orbitofrontal cortex, and the basal forebrain area. So, ultimately, these regions are implicated in executive control, cognitive skills, abstract reasoning, and planning, and they're critical for problem solving and inhibition. The frontal lobe is also the most developed brain region in humans than any other organism. And so we know frontal lobe damage can really mess stuff up. most famous case is, of course, Phineas Gage. Um, where a metal tamping rod went through his frontal lobe. After the accident, his personality changed completely. He was no longer the mild man, mild mannered man that he once was. And yeah, it was not good. His behavior completely changed and he could no longer inhibit himself. He was really rash and rude and eventually died shortly after. So. Moving on, I'm going to be talking about the anterior cingulate. So this was thought to be involved in empathy and self-control in impulses and decision-making, but also self-recognition, as discovered by some of our case studies. In alien hand syndrome, theoretically, part of the disorder was the inability to recognize the hand and hand movements as one's own. And this was theoretically thought to be due to the disconnect of the motor areas of the brain with the anterior cingulate cortex, recognizing the movement or motor plan as one's own. So, finally I want to talk about the theoretical behaviors that might emerge from an individual who has experienced complete bilateral limbic system dysfunction. At this point, we went through and discussed the majority of the important components that comprise the traditional limbic system and how they can go wrong individually. And theoretically, it's, uh, it's easy to add up all these dysfunctions and say that this is what would occur with full dysfunction in the limbic system. But as we've learned, really strange, unexpected things can happen in a network so complicated. Thus, with that being said, I want to cautiously theorize what could happen and then finally discuss an actual case study and what did happen. So the first thing that stands out to me that could result in these strange behavior in strange behaviors from this limbic dysfunction is the complete thalamic destruction that would that occurs. So that would completely wipe out all communication of senses to the cortex. We could not interpret or perceive any sensory information besides smell um, at all, basically, and. Due to the nature of the thalamus and how absolutely vital it is for all connections, I'm going to assume in this case that it is intact and functioning because the rest of the discussion would 
basically not come because it's likely that anyone could survive without a thalamus, and I couldn't find any case studies detailing someone without one. So, let's assume this individual has complete or majority destruction to re the remaining li limbic structures is still living, and they have a working thalamus. So now they have a lack of or destruction to their hypothalamus, hippocampus, amygdala, olfactory bulb, frontal lobe regions, and the anterior cingulate cortex. I would predict that this individual would be living with a complete lack of smell and partial lack of taste. The complete lack of smell is because the individual doesn't have any odorant receptors and they just won't smell. And the lack of taste is due to the fact that their tasting pathway isn't communicating with the most likely damaged hypothalamus. This individual would also resultingly have a very poor sleep schedule and their weight and appetite would fluctuate rapidly. The hypothalamus is not doing its job integrating satiety signals and it's not integrating uh, hunger and satiety signals uh, with the circadian rhythm and sleep-wake cycles. So this individual is not sleeping well and not eating right. Additionally, due to the hypothalamic dysfunction, their hormones are probably way out of balance as the hypothalamus is not communicating properly with the pituitary, and they will most likely see reproductive issues in the future. This individual will also not be able to form new memories like HM. I'd predict that this individual will have complete anterograde amnesia, although mo their old memories before the incident would be retained. It's due to the complete bilateral destruction of this individual's hippocampus, preventing the ability of consolidation. I would also predict this individual to be very immature and childish, but also quite rash and crass. I believe they would have a hard time communicating with others, have a hard time weighing decisions and making decisions, and overall have a hard time inhibiting undesirable behaviors. This is due to the lack of or dysfunction of their frontal lobe regions and their amygdala. This individual would also have trouble recognizing his actions as his own actions, would become disoriented easily, and have a general difficult time navigating the world. This is due to damage in the frontal lobe regions and the anterior cingulate cortex. I would guess that an individual with this true condition would be unable to survive on their own and, require, and would require multidisciplinary care and treatment for the entirety of the rest of their most likely very short life. So, now I'm going to discuss an actual case study and the behaviors that resulted from this individual and why. So, um, Feinstein et al. describes a patient known as Roger who has been studying his laboratory for over 14 years. Roger suffered bilateral brain damage encompassing a substantial portion of his limbic system. It occurred following an episode of herpes simplex encephalitis. Um, it destroyed neural tissue um, bilaterally to the hippocampus, amygdala, parahippocampal gyri, temporal poles, orbitofrontal cortex, basal forebrain area, anterior cingulate cortex, and insular cortex. When Roger was discovered to have herpes simplex encephalitis, he was rushed to the hospital and in a coma for nine days. He slowly stabilized and eventually was discharged. So what does Roger have? Roger has a severe uh, anosmia, or lack of smell, and severe agasia, or lack of taste. He also has dense global amnesia. He basically has no episodic memory for any events that have transpired over the past three decades, no memory of 9-11, and is bewildered when shown photos. No idea how much time has passed since his herpes encephalitis, has very little insight into his own condition. His sense of self seems certainly diminished, and it could be said that he doesn't remember what he doesn't remember. Roger now lives in an assisted care facility and shows a voracious appetite with no satiation, similar to what we saw in Prater Willie, but, and without monitoring, he will eat to the point of purging with no memory of how much food has been consumed. Despite this crazy amount of limbic destruction that's been happened that's happened to Roger, he lived and he has a normal IQ, above average attention, working memory, executive functioning skills, and a very good speech language skill comprehension set. It's really, really interesting to compare my predictions to Roger. Um, something to note is that um, is that Roger did not have 
thalamic or hypothalamic lesions or dysfunction, which makes sense because I predicted that the lack of a thalamus would mean certain death. Upon further thought, it makes sense that he does not have hypothalamic dysfunction or severe hypothalamic dysfunction as well um, because it would probably also kill him without a hypothalamus to control his pituitary. But some predictions ended up being pretty much correct. He eats um, fervently with no signs of satiation like I predicted. His personality completely changed. He has dense global amnesia. So I predicted that he would have uh, enteric rate amnesia, uh, but I did not predict that his old memories would be destroyed too. Um, and I also predicted he has a lack of awareness of time and an inabil inability to form new memories. Some predictions, although were completely wrong, his ability to communicate with people almost improved after the event. His social um, behavior changed. Um, he used to be really introverted and didn't like to talk to people, but after his brain damage, he actually became more sociable and extroverted. So he also retained his language and comprehension and communication skills, which I did not predict, and I would not have predicted, especially because he had orbitofrontal and basal forebrain damage, um, but he did not have specific prefrontal cortex or frontal lobe damage, which would be implicated in that sort of thing, so it makes sense why he retained those skills. So, yeah, in summary, Roger is a wild case study, and luckily, or fortunately, his case study makes sense comparing it to his physiological damages, right? He doesn't have a hippocampus, he can't form new memories, um, he had some impairments in food and eating, he had impairments in his social behavior and personality. He also showed some interesting OCD type behaviors. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's crazy how, how these things can come to be. I didn't even know someone's thalamus could be, or someone's uh, limbic system could be completely destroyed. And I thought it was kind of a ridiculous case study to imagine someone's complete and utter limbic system destruction, so I did not expect to find a real case study. Um, so how did, how did this happen to Roger? Just I want to touch on that. So it was from herpes simplex type 1 encephalitis that's what caused the brain damage. Basically, severe an inflammation follows uh, herpes simplex enceph and triggers a process of necrosis that leads to total disintegration of the affected tissue. The route of um, herpes simplex and ceph into the central nervous system is unclear, but it is theorized that the virus lays dormant in the ganglion of the trigeminal nerve, uh, which I think is tricranial nerve 5, and then becomes uh, reactivated by an unknown mechanism. It then progressively infects the brain through transneuronal spread. Fortunately, it only affects about two people per million a year. So it's very, very rare. But people do get these very rare neurological conditions, and they end up like people in our book, and they end up like people in Roger. Uh, but fortunately, we have multidisciplinary care homes that can take care of people and prevent him from eating himself to death. So that is my presentation, and thank you for listening. Here are my references. And that's all.